If you will, turn with me to Isaiah chapter 1. Isaiah chapter 1. Isaiah chapter 1. To begin with, we're going to read the 19th verse, and then we'll go uh, down to the end of the chapter, the Lord willing. But I want to just to start with, just read the 19th verse, then we'll pray, and we'll share some things with you. Isaiah chapter 1, and verse 19. God, speaking to the people of Israel, says, If you will be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. Notice that little word, if. If. Two other words I want you to notice, willing and obedient. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for blessing us. Thank you that we have this time together. Pray that you'll help us this evening. Guide us by your spirit into all truth. Once again, Lord, forgive us anything that has came in the way of your moving and blessing. And revive our hearts again, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we go farther, I want to just talk with you for a minute. Keep your Bible open, if you will. We're going to look at verses 19 to 31. But just want to talk to you a little bit. We live in a day of tremendous technology. There's no question about that. Technology is making more and more advancements. We already have. This is not something that may come someday. We already have driverless cars. Uh, there, there are already pilotless aircraft. Now, they're not in great abundance yet, but they, they do exist. Uh, somebody said, well, I can't wait till they have flying cars. Already here. Already here. Uh, and more and more. Matter of fact, uh, one of the, the big transportation companies in bigger cities is working on uh, a form of transportation where you can travel from rooftop to rooftop within a city uh, so as to not be snarling traffic. More and more happening with technology. And one of the tremendous advances that has been made is in the area of AI, they call it, not the city of AI in the book of Joshua, but artificial intelligence. Along with that, robotics. And more and more and more, there are robotic inventions that seem more and more human. As a matter of fact, recently, I'm not making this up, you can, you can look it up, check it out, recently, and when I say recently, I think about six months ago now, a robot was granted citizenship in a country. I'm not making that up, you, you can check that out. It wasn't this country, but who's to say that won't happen here? But a robot was granted citizenship. The Creator, God, created man in his own image. And man is trying to create something in his own image. Man is the creation, but he's trying to become the Creator. And by the way, making tremendous strides towards doing that. Now this is nothing new. Uh, for many decades now, they've been working on cloning and uh, the the fact of the matter is, I, I, I know a joke about cloning, don't have time to tell them. If you want to hear it, ask me after the service. I'll tell you. But the uh, fact of the matter is, that have been working on cloning, and as you may or may not recall, this is, again, this is some decades ago. In England, they actually cloned a sheep, and uh, didn't live very long, but they, they cloned one. And I read, oh, it must be 10, 10 years ago now, where they were taking uh, DNA from elephants and combining it with some cells that they had found preserved and trying to clone a mammoth. And I haven't heard that they've succeeded with that, but the effort was theirs. All kinds of things are going on. Man, the creation, wants to become the creator. There are some things that no matter how much we advance technology, that mankind will not be able to do. Mankind no matter what we do with artificial intelligence, we'll never be able to give its creature a spirit. Can't do that. I, I will not say they can't make something that looks human, moves like human, acts like human, talks like human, because that's already done. That's, again, that's not coming. It's here. It's here. 
But whatever mankind creates will not have a spirit. Only God can give a spirit. Because it is that part that is specifically created in the image of God himself. So how far will technology go? I, I wouldn't pretend to say. Uh, technology is already advanced beyond where many people thought it would ever be possible. And so will we go farther? I, I think so. People say, well, will they go to Mars? You know, plans, plans are in the works to do it. I read recently where the tickets have been, so this, I read it recently, it, it, it happened not just in the last few weeks, it happened some time ago, but they're already selling tickets for civilian space flight. You've got enough money, you can fly into outer space. Tremendous advances. I'm not opposed to all of that. I think some of it's maybe going too far, but I, I'm not opposed to all of it. But again, God puts a spirit in me. And with that spirit is a consciousness that cannot be artificial. Throughout the Bible, and the big point that I'm trying to make here is this. A robot or a computer or what a, a other form of artificial intelligence you might come along with has to be programmed. Well, human beings are programmed also. You're only going to get out of the instrument that which you program into it. And I remember back years ago, you don't hear this term much anymore, but you used to hear back in the 80s and 90s a term called GIGO. Anybody remember GIGO? Uh, about three of you do. Okay. GIGO stood for garbage in, garbage out. If you pro program garbage into your computer, you're going to get garbage back out. So if you want to get good things out of your computer, you've got to put good things in. But when God created mankind, as I said earlier, he created mankind in his own image, and he did not create a race of robots. Now, he certainly did program certain things into us, but he left us with what's called a free will. Now, there are some theologians who try to uh, teach you that you really don't have a free will, that everything is predestined, and, and uh, everything that is going to happen will happen no matter what, including whether you are saved or you're not saved, and everything else is just predetermined. Let me tell you where that idea comes from, and, and this isn't going to be popular with some people. I don't think anybody here tonight have an issue with it, but some would. Um, it doesn't come from the Bible. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible doesn't say everything that is to be will be. Uh, Curtis Hudson said, I believe everything is to be will be, even if it doesn't happen. Think that through a little bit. But the fact is, and, and you get hold of this, you have a choice. You get to make decisions because you do have a free will. Now, God is sovereign. God is in charge. And does God already know what you're going to decide? Yes. But he still gives you a choice. Now, several reasons for that. One, number one being, you are created in the image of God. So you are an autonomous being, and you have the opportunity to make your own decisions, your own choices. Good or bad? Number two, nobody is going to stand before God at the judgment day or at any other time, point a finger in God's face, say, you never gave me a chance. I, I had no opportunity. You created me. You predestined me to hell. I didn't have any choice about it. Nothing I could do. Uh, it, it's not fair. Nobody's going to do that because he gives everybody a choice. And we make our own decisions. It's been said that life is the result of the choices we make. And, and I don't know if that's 100% true, but there's a great deal of truth in that. So when we come to the Bible, what do we see? Oh, by the way, where does that idea that everything predetermined comes from? It comes from Hinduism. Hinduism called it karma. And in the Hindu concept of karma, everything is predetermined, everything's going to happen, is going to happen no matter what. You really don't have any choice. All you get to do is live out your karma. That's not biblical, folks. Neither is reincarnation. That's another Hindu creation. No such thing. Uh, somebody, a man asked me uh, just a few months ago, he said, 
um, can't you believe in, in uh, resurrection and reincarnation at the same time? I said, no, two, two entirely different things. Entirely different. I read many years ago the book of reincarnation, a Hindu book of reincarnation. I don't recommend it. It wasn't a pleasant reading. Why'd you read it? Well, somebody gave it to me, and I thought, well, let me see what this has to say. I read it. Uh, give you nightmares if you read it. But what, what it teaches, I, I do not make this up. Reincarnation basically is, is the idea, and the Buddhists have a little bit different slant on it, but it's not drastically different. Reincarnation is that you live your life, and then you die, and then you come back, because you didn't get it quite right, and you come back in different forms until you eventually get it right. For example, if you live your life and you are a slovenly <coughs> person, you just don't have any personal hygiene habits or anything of that sort, you may come back in your next life as a roach. Or, if, I'm not making this up, folks, I'm not. If you are a gluttonous person in this life, you may come back in your next life as a pig. You know, I know that doesn't even sound sane to you, but I'm telling you that is the teaching. Now, if you're a really, really, really good person, and you're giving and kind and loving, you might come back in the next life as a prince or princess. Well, then it behooves me to live a good life. Well, if, if that idea was true, it does, and if that idea isn't true, it still behooves you to live a good life. But that idea isn't true. It's not. That's not what the God of the universe, your creator, has designed. What he has done, and what we find in the Bible, is if and then. If and then. If you do one thing, God says, then this is going to happen. If you do a different thing, then God says, this will happen. The two half tribes of uh, Gad and Reuben and Manasseh, asked Moses to ask God for them if they could live on the east side of the Jordan River, not cross over into the west side. Moses went and asked the Lord. The Lord said, that's fine, but they need to, when time comes to enter the promised land, they need to go ahead, lead the way, and fight the battle to help the rest of their brethren claim the promised land. They agreed to that. Numbers chapter 32, verse 23, they're ready to cross in and God says to them, if you will not do so, do what? You will not do what you agreed to do. You will not go in and possess the land. If you do that, then you get to have be here with your people, with your families, in your area that you've chosen. But if you will not do so, if you will not go and help your brothers claim the land, behold, you have sinned against the Lord, and be sure your sin will find you out. What God is saying is, you don't do wrong, get away with it, but you have a choice in the matter. Well, that's what we have in the story before us here. God is speaking specifically to the people of Jerusalem. Now, not all of Isaiah is limited to Jerusalem, but this portion is. And God is speaking through the prophet Isaiah to Jerusalem. And here's what he says in verse 19. If ye be willing and obedient. Now, notice... He didn't just say, if you're obedient. Is it important to be obedient? It is. We ought to obey God. You and I ought to obey God. We live in a generation where nobody wants to obey anybody. I have done many weddings in my time. I can't even remember how many, but uh, two. Two weddings I did. And the premarital counseling, when we were talking about how the couple wanted their ceremony to go and what they wanted in their mouths, two different couples said, do not want the word obey in our vows. We do not want the word obey, and I'm not going to obey him. He's not going to obey me. We don't want that word in our, our vows. I don't think, to be honest with you, they understood that concept. I really don't. Oh, are you saying, preacher, that husbands' wives ought to obey each other? No, God says that. And it's part of love. Because look at it. 
It doesn't say if you be obedient. It says if you be willing and obedient. That obedience needs to come from the heart. You need to be willing to be obedient. Not just obedient, but willing to be obedient. I won't say what's the difference. The difference is you have a will. There's will in the word willing. You have a will in the matter, and you make a choice in the matter. If you're just going to be obedient and you have no will, then you are, in fact, like a robot. You're only doing that which you've been programmed to do. You're only doing that which you have to do. But if you're willing and obedient, then you are doing that which you choose to do. <coughs> and that's what God looks for in every person's heart. A willingness. Yes, does God want us to serve him? Yes. And what does that involve? It involves great deal. Let me put it as simply as I can. It involves living a life of service to the Lord. And that means a life that points others to faith in him. But if you're going to live that life, and you're not going to do it willingly, you will never do it successfully. It is important, it is essential to be obedient, but it is not all there is. If you be willing, then you'll have good success. Now, look at what else it says, verse 19. If you be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. You know what God's saying? If you obey me from a willing heart because you want to obey me, not because you have to obey me, not out of fear, not out of necessity, but because you want to obey me, I'll bless you for that, and you'll prosper me. Well, what's the other choice? Friends, it's the next verse. But, notice, verse 19 begins with if, verse 20 begins with but. But if you refuse and rebel, that is the absolute opposite of being willing and obedient, is to refuse and to rebel. If you refuse and rebel, ye shall be devoured with the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. In other words, God has said it, and this is exactly what's going to happen. If you refuse and rebel, you be willing and obedient, you're going to eat the good of the land. You refuse and rebel, you're going to be devoured by the sword. Now, it's your choice. You can do either one. Now, I want you to ponder that a second. Maybe a few seconds. I want you to think about, if that choice were laid before you, what would you do? Well, I'd willingly obey, then I could eat the good of the land. You'd think. Can I share with you, though, that's not human nature? It's not human nature. What do you mean it's not human? Human nature says I'm not obeying anybody. That includes God. That includes God. That includes anybody. I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to think what I want to think. I want to say what I want to say. And nobody, nobody, including God, is going to tell me what I should and should not do, what I can and cannot do. I'm the boss. Okay. You know what God's saying here? He's saying you can be. You can be. But if you are willing and you obey, you'll eat the good of the land. If you refuse, you're not willing, and you rebel, you're not obedient. You shall be devoured with the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Now notice the mouth of the Lord didn't just speak, you shall be devoured by the sword. The mouth of the Lord also spoke, you shall eat the good of the land. That's your choice. Now the Lord, as I said in this passage, directs, directly addresses <laughs> Jerusalem. Notice what he calls Jerusalem in verse 21. How is the faithful city? Stop there. No comma period there. Stop there just a second. You see what God refers to Jerusalem as the faithful city. The city full of faith. Do you know Jerusalem is that city where God set out all the earth? That is where I want to put my name, in the city of Jerusalem. Jerusalem also sometimes referred to as Zion. When in the late 1800s, early 1900s, a movement began to restore the nation of Israel. They, they didn't get the restoration of the state until 1948, so they were working on it well over 50 years. 
but they were to establish the country of Israel once again after 2,000 years of not having a country of Israel. You know what they called that? They called it the Zionist movement. The Zionist movement. Why? They were going to reestablish Jerusalem. Something happened this year that they've been wanting to see happen for all of these years. Since at least 1948. And, and by the way, uh, I'm not saying that this is, this is the end of their goal. It certainly is not the end of their goal. But it was one of their goals, and that is to have the United States Embassy in Jerusalem. Up until this year, it was in Tel Aviv. Uh, Tel Aviv is not the capital of Israel, but Jerusalem is the capital. The Knesset is not located at uh, their version of Congress or Parliament is not located in Tel Aviv, it's in Jerusalem. But there are those surrounding the country who oppose that. They say they want the city of Jerusalem in control of it, so they didn't want the U.S. to recognize Jerusalem as the capital. But this year, the United States Embassy was moved to Jerusalem. Now again, that's the goal of the Zionists. A goal. That's not the goal, it's a goal. What I'm trying to get to you is this. Jerusalem is a city that God claimed to put his name there. It is a city that is of extreme prophetic significance. I'd say more than any other city. There are other cities that, that have prophetic significance, but none to the degree that Jerusalem has. So God says in verse 21, Jerusalem is the faithful city where the temple was, Solomon's temple and the second temple that was built, and where people came to worship God. And it is where God says the Messiah, the Savior, the Christ, will come and rule on the throne of David from the city of Jerusalem. Notice what he says in verse 21. How is the faithful city, that city which was faithful, becoming harder? Notice the next two words. It was. Past tense. It used to be. It was full of judgment. Righteousness lodged in it. It used to be a place where a person could expect righteous judgment. Where you could go to court and you expected to get a fair ruling. You expected to get a right ruling. Where right was upheld. And by the way, let me just interject something here that we need to understand in this country. There is a basic, at the very basic, most foundational level, there is a difference between right and wrong. You say, well, everybody knows that. Well, not everybody acts like they know that. People seem to blur the lines between right and wrong all the time. Well, there's gray area. No, there is a basic foundational difference between what is right and what is wrong. What is true and what is false. What is real and what is not. So it was, past it used to be a city full of judgment. And when it was, then righteousness lodged in it. Righteousness lived there. Righteousness lived in Jerusalem. Righteousness will live in Jerusalem again when the Messiah comes. But God says righteousness used to live there. But now, murderers live there. Murder is about as far away from righteousness and righteous judgment as you can get. The taking of a human life. The destruction of that image of God which God created. That's murder. If you go to Exodus 20 and you read the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20, you'll find that it says, Thou shalt not kill. But when Jesus is reiterating that in the New Testament, you know how he phrased it? He said, thou shalt do no murder. Don't murder anybody. That's a universal idea. There's an old Chinese proverb that I don't think is, is based in the Bible. If it is, it's long after the Bible was written. But it says this. All life is precious, and none can be replaced. You know, that's true. No matter what 
language it comes from, no matter what culture it comes from, it's still true. All life is precious. None can be replaced. You take a life, you take something you can never give back. <coughs> you take a life, you take something that you didn't give in the first place and had no right to take. We have no right to destroy the image of God in others. Now, every time I preach that, somebody comes to me and says, what about war and what about capital punishment? The Bible addresses both those issues. I don't have time to get into all that tonight, but just understand God has addressed both those issues. He hasn't left those questions unanswered. Not talking about war. He's not talking about capital punishment here. He's talking about murder. He goes on. He says, thy silver is become dross. Now dross is the impurities that you want to separate from silver. But he says, your silver is turned into the impurity. <laughs> Thy wine mixed with water. It's watered down. It has no flavor. It has no taste anymore. Thy princes are rebellious. The leaders of the nation, the princes, have become rebellious. <clears throat> and what kind of rebellion were they in? Notice this. Thy princes are rebellious and companions of thieves. I was told when I was a little boy growing up that you'll be judged by the company you keep. I didn't believe that. I didn't. I said, no, I, my friends are who they are. I'm who I am. It doesn't matter. But you know, I found that's true. You are judged by the company you keep. And here is the God says, you, thy princes are rebellious and they're companions of thieves. Everyone loveth gifts and followeth after rewards. You know what he's saying? He's saying we we don't have righteousness anymore. We don't have good leadership anymore. What we have is the best leaders money can buy. And you think about that for a second. You got enough money, you'll get what you want. <clears throat> suppose, suppose that there was a person who had a high position in government and they it wasn't an elected position, it was an appointed position, but they had a high position in government and they lost their high position because they had taken bribes. They had taken money because they, everyone loved a gift and everyone followed after rewards. And they take money, so they lost their job. Then suppose that same person came back and ran for elected office and got elected. What would you think of the people that elected that person? They've already lost their leadership position because they took bribes. And now you vote for that person and put them back in office. Now you don't have to just suppose that. That has happened. I'm not going to name all the particulars, but that has happened. Where in our country? And somebody sitting there says, I know who he's talking about, and you probably don't. <laughs> That's what God is talking about here. Thy princes are rebellious and companions of thieves. Everyone loveth gifts and followeth after rewards. They judge not the fatherless. In other words, the fatherless come before them with a an issue, they need help, they need somebody to stand for them, somebody to give them justice, and they don't do it. Why? The fatherless don't give them gifts and rewards. Neither doth it, the cause of the widow come unto him. They don't stand up for the rights of the widow. They don't do justice. They do whatever they get paid to do. Companions of thieves, loving gifts and rewards, not defending the fatherless, not hearing the case of the widows. So what happens? Verse 24. Therefore, because of all this, therefore saith the Lord, the Lord of hosts, the mighty one of Israel, Ah, I will ease me of my adversaries and avenge me of mine enemy. Now who is he talking about? Is he talking about the heathen and other lands who are going to come attack Jerusalem? In this case, he's not. Who's he talking about? 
He's talking about the people of Jerusalem who were supposed to be his people. He's talking about the leaders of his people. When he says, I will ease me of mine adversaries and avenge me of my enemies. And, verse 25, I will turn my hand upon thee and purely purge away thy dross and take away all thy tin. What's he doing that for? Well, God's this big cosmic bully and he just wants to be harsh and hard on everybody and crush everybody under his power. <laughs> That's not true. Look again at verse 25. God says, I will turn my hand upon thee and purely purge away thy cross and take away all thy tin. Why? And I will restore thy judges as at the first and thy counselors as at the beginning. Afterward, thou shalt be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city. You know what God's saying? He's not saying, I'm just going to come in and smash you and destroy you. He says, I'm going to get rid of that which is corrupt. I'm going to get rid of that which is evil. I'm going to clean out that which is bad, and I'm going to bring you back to who you ought to be. A city of righteousness, a faithful city. God's saying, I'm going to restore Jerusalem. It will not be destroyed. It will be restored. 27, Zion, we mentioned that a little bit ago. Zion shall be redeemed with judgment and her converts with righteousness. There's not just going to be a physical restoration of Jerusalem. There's not just going to be a governmental restoration of Jerusalem. There's going to be a spiritual restoration of Jerusalem. Do not let anybody tell you that God has washed his hands and walked away from the people of Israel. He never. He made with them an everlasting covenant, and he will keep his covenant. That's why he says, I, even I, am the Lord, and I change not. Twenty-eight. And the destruction of the transgressors and of the sinners shall be together. And they that forsake the Lord shall be consumed. Those who are doing evil, those who are doing wrong, those who are uh, in rebellion will fall. Why? 29, for they shall be ashamed of the oaks which ye have desired, and ye shall be confounded for the gardens which ye have chosen. For ye shall be as an oak whose leaf faded, and a garden that hath no water. They, they will not prosper, the wicked will not prosper. Finally, verse 31, and the strong shall be as tow, and the maker of it as far tow, their meaning not kindling for a fire. And they shall both burn together, and none shall quench them. God says my judgment is going to be complete. But what is the purpose of it? The purpose of it is in verse 26 and 27. I will restore thy judges as at the first, and thy counselors as at the beginning. Afterward thou shalt be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city. Zion shall be redeemed with judgment, and her converts with righteousness. Now, Judgment did come upon Jerusalem. Jerusalem was destroyed. King Nebuchadnezzar came in with his armies and destroyed the temple and destroyed the city. Seventy years later, in the days of Ezra and Nehemiah, they came back to rebuild the walls of the city and to restore the temple. But for 70 years, the people of Judah remained captive in Babylon. Think present-day Iraq. The saddest part of that, there are bad parts to it, but the saddest part is this, it didn't have to be that way. They had a choice. Go back to verse 19. If ye be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if ye refuse and rebel, ye shall be devoured with the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. He laid before them a choice. Do you know what? God gives all of us a choice. The message to Judah and Jerusalem is a message to all of us. The message is that the love of, and grace of God is greater than our sin. And if we'll turn to him and trust him, he'll restore us. But if we refuse him and reject him, then we choose our own path of destruction. Let me share it with you in a New Testament way. God 
so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish will not perish but have everlasting life for god sent not his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved he that believeth on the son is not condemned but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. It's the same thing he's saying here in verses 19 and 20. God says, my love is here for you. My grace is here for you. I want to restore you. I want to rebuild you. I want to reinstate you. But if you will not, if you refuse, and if you rebel, you shall be devoured with the sword. The people made this choice of the second. And they were wrong. It didn't have to be that way. Folks, we need to think of how that applies to us. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for blessing us. Thank you for your words so clear and so plain. Lord, help us to see how you extend your hands of grace towards us. How you would pull us in and hold us close to your heart. How you would restore us. How you would rebuild us. How you would reinstate us. Lord, help us not to be rebellious people. Help us to be willing and obedient. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. This is second, we're going to sing a hymn of invitation. If God's spoken to your heart, there's a spiritual need in your life, you need to respond. This is your opportunity to do it. I'll stand out head of the center aisle. I'll be glad to meet with anybody who wants to come. And pray with you, counsel with you, help you with the needs that you have. Father, bless me with this invitation time. We do pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. We're singing tonight.